We've also done some qualitative studies, and we found some really, really remarkable things. And the one that is most encouraging to me is this one. For the way the kids work with the projects, no significant gender or ethnic differences. And we were expecting, like, oh, maybe this will work well for some populations and not for others. But as far as we can tell, just having a bunch of stuff out on the tables and standing back and watching the magic happen seems to work well for everybody. Um, and, and that has been really, really encouraging. There are differences in terms of the pattern of interactions um, in some ways, but mostly nothing significant here. Oh, yeah, and here's how long they tend to spend with the project. 15 seconds. That's how long they stay with one station. And then it's like they spent 15 seconds with that and they learned something. <coughs> it's, it's, really, it's really really quite remarkable. It's really quite remarkable. Um, I want to look at some examples. And I promised in, 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 in the abstract you were going to see some examples. And I always find it kind of like ironic that talking about like hands-on teaching and how important it is to do that by Senate presenting a series of slides. And so we're actually going to show some stuff, and we have a couple of things that people can actually try. And that's also going to give me a chance to involve some of the little shop of physics um, people who have like traveled across Nebraska with me. So I'm going to show you some examples of some things we've done. And first up, Sheila is going to come up, and we're going to demonstrate this device right here for teaching about energy. We're teaching with toys. This is a little play school car, and it runs down the ramp and goes around this little thing. And there's a coil spring that's inside here. And you crank it up with this little device right here. If I take this car and I put three crank or cranks worth of energy inside here, and I push the button, it goes around the tank. One. Oh, whoops. Gotta try that again. Okay. <laughs> I'm gonna push on it. All right, here we go. Three cranks. Okay. And then we let it go in. What's the mimic? Farther back. And we learn more from our failures than from our successes. <laughs> I think that's, I should have put that in there. Here we go, try it farther back. And, yay, one, two, three, four, five, six point five. Excellent. And then, if we crank it six times, oh my gosh. <laughs> we can try it and see what happens. Here we go. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Point five. And so it's essentially a double, which is fantastic. And this has got a coil spring inside it, and it's a constant force. So every crank puts the same amount of energy inside here. And we use this as introducing the idea of conservation of energy. And kids kind of get this. Like, you crank more, there's more stuff inside there, and so it can, like, do more. Works, works, works great. And this is one I actually use in my class to introduce this whole idea of energy in, energy out. Um, works really, really well. One of the first things we do with stuff is like we take it apart and we try to do different things to it. This is the device that we made out of a camera flash. We had a camera flash that someone gave us, and people often give us things that are broken and say, I have this broken device and I thought of you, and I try to take it personally. <laughs> camera flash, broken bulb, and so we said, well, we can just put another bulb inside there. So let's take the wires that connect to the camera flash, and let's hook it up to the power supply. Here's a fluorescent light bulb hooked up to a uh, camera flash. And what happens? Nothing. But there's another wire, there's one that connects to each end of the bulb, there's another one that was connected to a piece of metal tape that wraps around the bulb. And if you hold your finger on that wire while your student presses the camera flash button, you get a tremendous shock, as we discovered. <laughs> what happens is, there's a big voltage which is on there, and the big voltage ionizes gas inside the tube and triggers a discharge. And I can do that with this fluorescent light bulb. I'll make that high voltage by building up a static charge on here, and every field around here is enough to rip electrons off of atoms and trigger a discharge. And so I can do that without touching it. And I'm not exactly sure why it's doing that. It's cool. Never done that before. Hmm. Anyway, something interesting happening there. I'll have to play with that later and see what that's about. Um, making things better. We can like take them apart and do that. But in addition, we also make things bigger. This is something I learned from a high school sheriff on. I went one year and people would bring something up and people would say, bigger. And we kind of incorporated that into like the little shop of physics culture. And so we take things and make them bigger. For instance, you've all seen these little energy balls, which have these two electrodes here. You can make a little circuit and the little ball goes, wah, 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 wah. Well, how about if you took it and took the electrodes and made them bigger, what could you see? And Ken is going to help me out with this. And then if we go ahead and crank up the amplifier and connect the circuits. 
<laughs> it's bigger, but wait, there's more. When you make the electrodes bigger, you also do this. It's a very, very small current that's inside that makes it go. And you can make enough current without even touching it by basically pushing charges through it, by bringing statically charged objects next to it. For instance, scotch tape. So this is energy ball, one electrode here, one electrode there, connected to a little honeytone amplifier, which is the best replacement for the radio shack amplifier that we've been able to find. And the can is going to take two pieces of tape, and he's going to make, oh, by the way, too, listen to this as he pulls it off the roll. little static charge thing going on. He's going to make a little sandwich. If you make a sandwich of two pieces of tape, the particular brand of tape that we're using, two different strips of tape? I think we're good. Think we're good? Pull apart the sticky end. I got the sticky end. Mine is negative. Current goes through in this direction. It makes the thing go. So if I bring negative charges down towards this plane, I push negative charges in the other direction. Watch this. If I pull them away, nothing. I have to push them closer. Get over their negative charges. And then Ken has got a positively charged strip of tape. He's got to push the charges in the other direction. So you can show that we've got two different signs of charges on the, on the tape here, which is really, is really, really fantastic. And, and it does. You're just pushing it from one side to the other. Fantastic. And Ken, made this device and then discovered subsequently that these kind of like really, really cool things because it's next to one of the static electricity devices and the kids are charging things up and trying stuff out. Thank you very much. So then, another piece, and this is a phrase that she loves about me, repetition with a twist. So to do things again, but to do it in a different way. And so we want to have a concept and to reinforce it, we want to do the concept one more time. We're going to do it in a different way. And we'll show you a way we do this with ideas of efficiency. Efficiency and energy is something we've been spending a lot of time with. And the first one I have is this battle of the bulbs. And Adam Perlstein is going to help me out with this. And we've got a cordless drill hooked up as a generator. And this is a whole bunch of these uh, incandescent lights. And we have the LED lights. And Adam's going to start with the incandescent bulbs. And he can feel how much work it takes to turn the crank. Oh, look at how hard he's working. But if we switch to the LED. Oh, we switch the incandescent. <laughs> we switch the LEDs. Oh. So you get this idea about the efficiency. It's very visceral. You can feel it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Adam. And then, to make the attempt in a different way, we've got this device right here. This is called the Efficiency Marathon. And Paul Williams is going to help out with this. And we've got two 20 Fahrenheit capacitors. You can get these super capacitors now. We get these, um, we buy these little uh, cars from like the technology companies. There's like a 20 Fahrenheit capacitor built inside. It's like six bucks and fantastic. 20 Fahrenheit capacitors, LEDs, incandescent lamps. And this is a race between the incandescents and the LEDs. And here we go. Oh, and they're both on, they're both on, but oh my, oh. Oh, the incandescent bulbs are going out. And Ken says they, they won the race. They went out first. But we prefer to think of it. But no, look. The LED bulbs, they're continuing to go on. The incandescent bulbs are all out. All out of juice. And the LEDs keep on going. And they'll go for quite some time. So it's a good way to get the same concept. The incandescent bulbs are using a lot more energy. You have to put a lot more in. Or if you have a certain store of energy, it lasts a lot longer if you use it at a solar rate. Thank you, Paul. So this is another way of the same concept. Then... We're going to show kids, oh, why is that true? We're going to let you do an experiment that explores that. And this uses the jitterbugs. Um, you can get these little solar cells mounted on top of a, there's a pager motor that goes with them. And when the energy light shines on the solar cell, it turns the pager motor, and it's in the body of a grasshopper, and the grasshopper dances around, little solar grasshoppers, um, fantastic little devices. And if you take the solar grasshoppers and you put them under the compact fluorescent lamp, what happens is, no dancing, very, very sad. But if you put them under the incandescent lamp, oh yeah, it's happy time. Then we put them under the compact fluorescent and, oh, not so much. And under the incandescent, yay. Same light outputs. And kids can see these look the same, but there's something different about them. Or oh, if they want to see what's different about them, 
What's different about it is the infrared. This is a picture that was taken through an infrared filter. The infrared filters we mount in these goggles. We have infrared goggles. And these are one of the things that we'll have out with the display. And you have to see this. And if you look through these, it allows you to see beyond the rainbow. I am now seeing in the infrared. And I gotta say, in the infrared, you guys are looking sharp. Um, when you look at these bulbs here, this one I see nothing, and this one is extremely bright. And the reason is, of course, the incandescent bulb, most of the energy it's giving off is in the infrared. The bulbs in the ceiling, infrared as well, which tells me that they're incandescent. And so we give these to kids, and we teach them this, and we have them look at different bulbs. And it's a, it's a wonderful lesson, reinforces the same point. And the efficiency, the lack of efficiency of the incandescent bulbs is because most of the energy is in a form that you're not able to see it, and so we go beyond the rainbow with, the, with those. But you can go out the other end of the rainbow as well. And one of the things